Good morning, everybody. My name is Cherry, I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Hi, Cherry. Hi, Cherry. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Deb. Beautiful music to bring us in this morning. Welcome, everyone. If you're tuning in for this first time here with our YouTube channel, we're so happy to have you joining us. And if you're a regular, it's good to see you and have you back again. Some announcements I want to get through this morning, so hang on and here we go. A reminder. Pastor Martha's prayer and meditation meeting is still taking place via Zoom on Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. The next meeting will be available for you at March 10th at 11. Let Brooklyn at the office or give Mount Martha or somebody a call and let them know you'd like to attend. And they'll supply you with a Zoom link and you can surely get that done. And we're still looking for volunteers for the Story of Hope this morning. Uh, every, actually, every Sunday morning coming up, we're going to need uh, several from end of March and into April. So if you'd like to attend and uh, share your story of hope, uh, we'd be happy to have you here. So we'll again call the office. The annual flower sale is going on and getting started and revved up. Uh, this is an annual fundraiser we started with some help from some lovely people in our church. Get us going on that. Uh, Brooklyn will be sending out an email. So watch your email inbox for information on dates, uh, how to place your orders, selection of your orders, and uh, that will be available starting March 9th. And then we have a really great announcement is that we're going to start doing in-person worship again. Well, limited. March 14th, we're going to start, actually we're going to start televising live uh, starting March 14th, we hope. Uh, fingers crossed, but either way, we're going to allow up 40 people attend at one time. Now this is a trial that we're doing, and we're going to see how it works, but it will be first come, first serve. You will need to send an email to the office. I'll get you that information here again in a minute. So starting on March 8th at 6 p.m., you can email the office or call the church office number and leave a message. Four people limit per email or call. If you include in that email the number of people you're attending so we can keep count and keep track, and then no later than March 10th, you're going to get a call back from Brooklyn on that, and he will confirm that. So we're going to try this and see how it works. Um, no, it's not going to be comfortable at first, but uh, we need to keep our numbers here because of the continued pandemic and the concern and keeping our social distancing. Plus, we have a lot of equipment for the recording still. So we're going to see how this works. But if you'd like to get that chance, remember, March 8th, 6 p.m., set your clocks, uh, send in your email, reserve your spot, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So this is really exciting, really exciting to be moving forward in this. It is a true story of hope on its own. So thanks for tuning in, thanks for watching us, and God bless us. We'll get on to that part. Pastor Mark, excuse me, I'm going to get started this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the Recovery Church. My name is Martha, and I'm a very grateful recovering alcoholic. I believe today is the third Sunday of Lent. That means we're about halfway through. And by Easter, we hope to have even more than 40 people in the sanctuary. I invite you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine that you're here. Welcome to this place which we make holy, which you make holy by your presence. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths, all your fears and anxieties, all your loves and your hopes, all your mistakes and your foolishness. For here you need not hide or pretend to be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this place where we can touch and be touched, heal and be healed, forgive and be forgiven. Together we make this a holy place. Now let us pray. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Christ did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. 
that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. And now please join us in singing Amazing Grace My Chains Are Hard. things up too. 
And so I, I had this, I was kind of disappointed that when I, I thought all of you adults knew what you were doing. And then when I got to be an adult, I found myself doing the same thing that I saw all the other, all, all, all the other adults do. And that was pretending to know everything. And if I didn't have an answer, I'd make an answer up, and I would just go forward. And I thought, you know, if everybody just did everything the way that I thought they should, that the world would be in a much, much better place. Thankfully, they didn't listen to me. But then my life kind of fell apart. And, and I realized that I was only half as smart as I thought I was. And once I realized that, I think I was really twice as smart as I ever was before. <laughs> and if you can figure that out, then you're a better man than that. But it was a matter of understanding that, as my friend Joe often says, I don't know nothing. He says it a little different than that, but for this morning, we'll just say, I don't know nothing. And for me to be able to realize that and say that, doesn't mean that I don't know anything. There are so many things that I know and so much that I can share and be a part of. But I don't know as much as necessarily I thought I did. And the beautiful thing about coming to this church is that it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to be broken. It's okay to be, it's okay to be afraid of the dark. It's okay to be afraid of the monster in the closet, because that's what we are all, we're all like, we all have our fears and our, our, the things that make us scared or sad. But when we come together, we realize that we don't have to have the answers for that. We can lean on each other, we can lean on God, and we can find those answers. So, you know, we talk about brokenness in this church. And we, we don't celebrate our brokenness, but we acknowledge our brokenness. And we learn to live in it. And there's another expression I learned a while ago, and, and that's, I'm not okay, and you're not okay, and that's okay. It's okay to be broken. The important part of being broken for me has been to learn to admit I am a broken person, and to ask for help, and ask for help. So, sometimes the adults are right, sometimes they're not. The challenge for us is to figure out when that is, and we may need some help doing that. Because trust me, there was some great advice I gave to my kids and grandkids that I'm grateful they never listened to. So, <laughs> Let's say a little prayer. Dear Heavenly Spirit. Dear Heavenly Spirit. Spirit accept us in our brokenness. Accept us in our brokenness. And teach me to accept me with my brokenness. And teach me to accept me with my brokenness. And give me the strength and humility. And give me the strength and humility. To ask for help. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good day. We'll see you soon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brooklyn, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Brooklyn. Welcome to service again. And this is the time of the service where we lift up our prayers as a community. So if you're at home having your coffee um, with your loved ones, if there's anyone that's on your mind or in your heart, um, when we lift up a prayer, you can say their name or just to touch your heart. So first, for the alcoholic and addict that are still struggling to find their way, we ask for God's blessing that they may find recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For 
for all that are ill or in pain, or that are struggling with any isolation, any anxiety, any depression, or any other mental issues, we pray for God's grace. Lord, in your mercy. And for the homeless, may they find shelter and food and pray for another healthy day. We pray for God's protection.
Here's what happened. Straight from the big book, page three. We learned that we had to concede, fully concede, to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. I surrendered. I gave up fighting and I surrendered to a new way of life. By the way, I forgot to start my timer, so give me a one minute heads up. Um, and um, here's some good news. Here's something else that I learned and read. It's on the back of my medallion. I was telling Martha, it says, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path, rarely. That's good news, that gave me hope. It also says in there, we of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were once just as helpless as Bill was. Nearly all have recovered. So I began to have hope. I began to see people dealing with problems in a new way. A way in which I was ill-equipped to deal with problems. And that was a spiritual way. <clears throat> the big book tells me that we simply need to pick up simple something like this there was nothing left for us to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet i didn't have any tools i had a sledgehammer <laughs> if it needed a phillips screwdriver i had a straight one that's about all i had anger and rage greed selfishness those were my tools that's how i solved things and so i started to learn about the principles behind the steps the spiritual kit of tools laid in my feet. And I started to use those tools, and they started to work. And they're, they're, they're much more effective. They're much more effective. But they're really hard sometimes. They're, they're things that were completely foreign to me, like letting go, doing nothing, prayer, meditation, humility, um, so I was really, when I came in to this program, ill-equipped. My, my coping mechanisms were drugs and alcohol and escape and fear and ego and things like that. And this program has given me, as it mentions in the big book, a design for living. And there's only one step that mentions alcohol. That's the first step. The rest of the steps teach me how to live. And I, being married now, I have lots of opportunities to practice that. <laughs> and then um, the other thing it taught me was, says on page 77, our real purpose is to be of maximum service to God and others. Twenty-some years ago, a college professor took a great risk and had a conversation with me after I was trying to convince her that I was an airline pilot. And I kept stuck to my guns. You don't understand, I'm an airline pilot. And she said, I don't think so. She said, I think your talents are being wasted in the front of that airplane. And it was at that moment that I knew that my path was going to be different. I did go on to become an airline pilot. I did that for 20 years. And uh, that went away as a result of the pandemic. But I embarked on another journey, and that was helping others by virtue of my, my business running sober houses. And uh, thank God for those people in our lives that courageously tell us things we don't want to hear. I didn't want to hear that. I was an airline pilot. And she shot that down. She shot that down. And I heard her, and I knew at that moment that I was going to do something else. And so I, I embarked on another journey of helping others in the, the way I'm very fortunate to be able to do, which is providing sober living opportunities for people. So, and then real quickly here, the, um, I think the biggest way I would encapsulate my recovery coming full circle 25 years in, was my mother left when I was four years old. And that sort of made me a ripe candidate for addiction, stuffing my feelings and medicating and everything like that. And about 20 years ago, 
So that was when I was four, and I grew up with some real mistaken beliefs about myself, mainly that I was unlovable. And about 20 years ago, I met a beautiful lady, and we were in the park. And uh, she, she had a young son. And I said, what's the story? You know, where's his daddy? And she said, well, his daddy left. I said, oh, that's horrible. When? When did his daddy leave? His daddy left when he was four. And uh, my higher power is not so sometimes. And it was, I knew at that moment that I was going to marry her. She's right up there. <laughs> and uh, raise that boy. And so I, I realized then that this wasn't about me anymore. This was about what do I have to offer? What do I have to bring to these people? And I know from my own experience, um, Ryan needed a daddy. Ryan needed a daddy. And so I stepped up and get to be that guy now. I get to be that guy, not the guy crawling into the doggy door. And that feels good. And I know when I get up there, when I get called home, <clears throat> God's going to say, good job. Um, well done. And so it's a lot easier to live that way than, than with all the lies and the self-centeredness and all, all the other things that I've brought to the table. So grateful to be here. Very grateful to my higher power, to two guys named Bill W. and Dr. Bob that laid this program out for me. And grateful to all the other people that I've come across along the way that have showed me a new way to live. Wow, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate your words this morning. What words of hope those are. Uh, we have a mission here at the Recovery Church is to provide a spiritual community for those in search of growth, healing, and recovery. And it's through financial gifts that we're able to do that. So, of course, I'm here to talk about your financial giving and thank you for all your support during this last year. The difficult times that are looking like we're going to get a break, and that gives us all hope. So, thank you for your gifts, and we would like to thank you for your continued gifts and continued giving in two ways. One, you can send a check to 253 State Street here in St. Paul, Minnesota, 55107, or you can go to our website. Click on the red heart, go in, it'll take you to our secure website portion of the website and you can uh, donate there one time or you can set up a regular. So if you're new to giving, uh, just ask a few easy questions and then uh, if you want to set up for coming out monthly as I do, I find it very convenient, uh, you can also do that. So thank you again for your gifts, it keeps our mission going, it's kept it going and uh, we're going to give you a little music. I contemplate your giving. Thank you.
I'm still sopping up the tears from Callan's story. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Bob, for sharing that. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from one of Paul's letters to the church at Corinth. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Kind of like Bob saying he was half as smart as he thought he was, and then he got me to be twice as smart. <laughs> have you ever noticed that just when you think you have it all figured out, God seems to turn everything upside down on his head? Maybe you've heard the saying that if you want to make God laugh, just make plans. We really shouldn't be surprised. Scripture tells us again and again that God loves a good paradox. And that God's wisdom is foolish, or may seem that way to us when we first hear it. And really, who wants to look foolish? It's not usually our goal. I'm going to tell you a story because we may need a little bit of humor during Lent. I was once a part, I met with a group of women who requested a Bible study for 6.30 on Friday mornings. You'll know why this is humorous to me. And I was supposed to lead it. I was the minister. Can you believe it? They were high-powered, executive-type women, and they wanted to study the Bible, but had to squeeze it in before working hours. It was intense, because these women were pretty intense. Indeed, they were kind of driven. High achievers, for sure. At the end of the year, though, a few of the women planned an evening gathering. It's the first thing I was really awake for the whole year. <laughs> but they planned for us to have a potluck and share a meal together one evening. I recall we met at a beautiful home and sat outside next to a river. There was a bonfire, and there was probably some wine involved. But as the sun was going down, someone suggested that we each tell the story of our most embarrassing moment. I have never laughed so hard in my life. <laughs> Not only at others, but at myself. My favorite story came from a woman I will call Sue. Sue was a quiet young minister's daughter from Iowa. She hardly ever said a word in the Bible study. She spoke of being painfully shy in high school. By her junior year in high school, she had never had a date. So her brother set her up with one of his college friends, and they arranged to go to a movie. Needless to say, she was extremely nervous. He picked her up, and as they were driving to the movie, she thought herself all stuffed up. She had some allergies, and she was a little nervous. And it was dark in the car, so she took out her Vicks inhaler, and she took a few sniffs of that inhaler. She took it out, took a few more. Did that three or four times on their way to the movie and didn't think he noticed a thing. Well, when they got to the movie theater, Sue's date turned to her and said, you need to go to the restaurant. She said, no, I'm fine. He said, no, you need to go to the restaurant. No, I'm, I, don't, I don't have to go. He said, really, you need to go to the restaurant. And so she walked in the women's room and looked in the mirror, only to find that she had been taking out a tube of bright red lipstick <laughs> and sticking it up her nose. 
She said she wanted to stay in that bathroom for the rest of her life. <laughs> well, have you ever made a royal fool of yourself? <laughs> Turns out you are in good company. The passage we just read from Corinthians tells us that when Jesus told people he would die on a cross, the people saw that as a very sick joke. The symbol that has become the central symbol of Christianity was seen as offensive and inappropriate humor. Jews demanded signs like the epic appearances of God in the past. They wanted a burning bush or the parting of the Red Sea or a mountaintop experience. The Greeks, now they wanted wisdom, a good philosophical argument. They wanted logic, rational explanations. But neither of these approaches had worked. Paul takes these two categories for greatness in the ancient world, wisdom and power, knowledge, and turns them on their heads. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And that was the most ridiculous symbol of all to choose for a conquering savior. The cross, a crude tool of execution. If ever there was a symbol of abuse, dominance, and powerlessness, it was the cross. The cross was not just an instrument of death. It was an instrument of torture, of slow death. It may be hard for us to wrap our minds around because for us, the cross has taken on so much more significance. But when Jesus told his followers that he would die on a cross, his words were offensive. The cross had yet to be redeemed by the resurrection. The cross was a sign of abject failure. The cross was for losers. Oh sure, let's follow that guy. <laughs> what a great marketing tool he has, he's come up with. Someday, everybody will be wearing little crosses around their necks, right? Well, but therein lies the paradox. Many of us do wear this symbol around our necks. Let's go back to that lovely evening and the women at the river. Let's remember Sue's story. Something else happened that night. After Sue had told her story. This had been her biggest embarrassment growing up. Do any of us have a junior high or high school story that we've just never told anyone? She still felt shame when she thought about it, and she had never told this story to anyone. Something happened when she told it, and we all laughed. Not at her, but with her. And she began to laugh, too. That's what happens when we share our weakness and vulnerability with others. We all make mistakes, and we can all relate to them. Through Jesus, God is telling us that it is precisely through our brokenness and weakness that God will find that entryway into our lives. Think about recovery meetings, where people sit around and tell stories they never would have imagined speaking aloud, or even when they come here to share a story of hope. And they might not tell in other group settings. And of the laughter, Others smile or laugh with recognition and acceptance. Oh yeah, been there too. These stories help us surrender our need to be in control and to look good, our need to figure it all out, our need to be God. They land us in the lap of the one who is God. Recently I heard a woman at a meeting say something that I have heard many times before, and you've probably heard it too. She said, I used to hate it when people said, I am a grateful recovering alcoholic. She said, I vowed I would never say that. I would never say I would, be, I would never say that I was grateful to be an alcoholic. But here I am, she said, after nine years, and I'm saying it. I see now that the thing that almost killed me, the thing I hated most in my life, is the thing that has saved me. The cross that hangs in our sanctuary over there is a perfect reminder of this paradox. 
John Kuntz, in crafting it, took broken alcohol bottles and turned them into a cross. A reminder that God can take our very instruments of death and destruction and turn them into a whole new life. This is our Lenten journey. We are moving toward the cross. If there are things that are killing you, bring them to the communion table. Lay them at the foot of the cross. Let go of them, and let's see what God can do with them. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Thanks be to God. Amen. celebrate open communion here at the Recovery Church. All are invited to the table where forgiveness and new life are freely given. So come to this table, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often, and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed, all are welcome at this table. Some of us grew up believing that we were not worthy to gather the crumbs from under the table. But know that if you feel that way, you are the guest of them. So before we come, I invite you to close your eyes for a moment and let go of any foolishness that you are hearing. Give it to God, knowing that you 
are forgiven. Anything you regret, anything you are sorry for, anything you have messed up on, offer it. so terrible that God's love cannot forgive it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Blessed is our brother Jesus who walks with us on the road of the world's suffering and who is known to us in the breaking of the bread. On the night of his arrest, Jesus met with his imperfect friends, took the bread, blessed it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. My life broken open for you. Take and eat this and remember me. In the same way, he took the cup after, after the meal, blessed it, passed it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood willingly shed for you. So, loving God, through your goodness, we have this bread and this cup to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. May we know your presence in the sharing of this bread, so that we may know your touch in all bread. We celebrate the life that Jesus has shared among his community for centuries and shares with us now. Made one in Christ and one with each other, we offer these gifts, and with them, we offer ourselves. Amen. Let us pray. <coughs> We do not have to be perfect or even good to come to this table, O oh Lord. We simply need to come as we are and to celebrate your power to change our lives. We know that we have fallen short of what we want to do. We trust only in your love. We rejoice that your love is so great that you invite us to come as guests, especially in our brokenness. Grant that we may receive this sacrament as a turning point in our lives, may we grow to be like you as you become the center of our living. Amen.
Help us to keep in deep community love toward one another, in patience in the midst of the problems of life, and in the hope of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives in our lives, and with you, through the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. And now let us join hands and hearts in close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you. 